The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith, increase our faith. And the Lord replied, if you all had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. These poor disciples in Luke's gospel, I can't help but feel for them. They can't seem to catch a break here. As they've been making their way in these last chapters with Jesus toward Jerusalem and toward his cross, it certainly awaits him there, Jesus' teaching to them has become more and more and more difficult, increasingly pointed. And he's asking them to do some pretty extraordinary things. Things like giving away all their possessions, forgiving anybody who harms them as many times as it takes to pick up their cross and follow him, and on and on and on come the invitations. Hmm. Is it any wonder that they ask for more faith? It ain't much of a stretch to imagine that they are feeling by this point incredibly insufficient uh, to the challenges that Jesus is laying at their feet. Unable to imagine accomplishing any of the things he's asking. And considering for one moment the world in which you and I live, up to our necks in all sorts of reasons to be afraid or to simply be discouraged, and we can begin to understand what those disciples were asking for. Many of us are asking for the same thing. Just a little more faith. A little more faith to make it through, much less to make a difference, right? Just to make it. But then something interesting happens in this story because when the disciples recognize their need and they ask Him for help, they ask Him for more faith to do what He would have them do, don't you think, that Jesus would be pretty psyched about that, you know, that request, and give them exactly what they asked for, give them more faith. Instead, an interesting twist. He basically says, nah, uh-uh. If you had even a speck of faith, he says, implying that really they don't, huh? even have faith the size of a mustard seed, and we think, what the heck? Is that any way to respond to the disciples' heartfelt and earnest request? For more faith. Well, what if the request those disciples make isn't just earnest and heartfelt, but what if it's just plain wrong? Hmm? What if it's just wrong? Well, maybe then Jesus' sharp retort was just what they needed. And maybe it's just what we need hmm? to reorient, to redirect them and us to the fact that God is doing amazing things in and around us already. And to maybe recognize the totally sufficient faith that we are already possessed of. Hmm. Maybe. My septic tank needs emptying. That is a hard segue right there. But it, I, bear with me for a moment, okay? My septic tank needs emptying because it has never been emptied in the six and a half years that we have been living in this particular house, okay? It was a new construction when we bought it, so the tank was buried out behind the house in the backyard, drain field put in, and the lid that accesses said tank was buried also, all right? And while normally, um, well, <laughs> first I should say this. You see, recently I've been imagining what could happen if I don't attend to this thing, you know? Because what will happen sure as shooting, you know, is that that thing is going to back up probably in the middle of January, right? And it'll back up in my daughter's basement shower, <laughs> you know, on some Monday morning at 6.30. And who needs that kind of drama, right? So I decided that now would be a good time to address it. And while this normally wouldn't be a big deal, locating and excavating said tank lid... What complicates the matter just a little bit for us is the deck that was built off the house into the backyard, and then the half a dozen poplar trees I had planted pretty dang close to the deck, not thinking at all about where the septic tank or its lid might be, right? And so this last week has found me in fervent prayer for faith, somewhere in the vicinity of at least mustard size, so 
I could miraculously have one of those popular, poplar trees <laughs> get up and walk across to the neighbor's yard if necessary, or at least locate and levitate the stupid lid that's under the ground. But here's the sad fact, right? And this is true, that no amount of praying or pleading or petitioning is going to locate and levitate that stupid concrete lid, right? So, early this last week, with the help of a, a prod and a shovel and a little bit of luck and God's grace, I managed to locate it. And a half an hour of digging later, I had this lid cleared and ready for the septic dude to come this Thursday, snow providing, right, <laughs> to come and do his thing and thereby keeping peace in the household and avoiding domestic disaster. And the heck of it is, no one congratulated me for this. No one said, nice job, thank you, dear. Thank you, Dad, for helping avoid a, my bathroom from becoming a toxic waste dump sometime this winter. There was no Dad of the Year award, no special plaque made or engraved, and no citation given. Nothing. And Jesus said, Servants aren't invited to the table with the landowner. They eat when their work is done. Nor do they deserve over-the-top congratulations simply for doing their job. Right? They just do it. And maybe that is exactly what faith is like. Hmm? Simply the willingness to do what needs to be done. Faith is not, in other words, some kind of scarce commodity that needs to be hoarded or saved or spent or added to or whatever. Moreover, faith is almost never heroic. In fact, it usually ain't, but instead is simply and humbly doing what needs to be done, big or small, great or mundane, just because it needs doing. This ain't the first time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus has hinted at this fact, you know. At this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus has already named as faithful, in other words, full of faith, a woman's desperate confidence that if she just touched the hem of his garment, she'll be healed. That happened in the third chapter of Luke. A centurion's concern for a sick servant, that was in the seventh chapter. A woman's gratitude at being forgiven, that was the end of the seventh chapter. And very soon in Luke's gospel, he will call full of faith a Samaritan leper who was healed and returns to just say thank you. And the plea of a blind beggar for sight in chapter 18. Just thank yous and pleas for help. Hmm. So maybe it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus challenges the disciples' perception about faith by pointing them to the far far from illustrious and noteworthy hard work and service of a servant, simply performing his duty, doing the things that need to be done. One of my colleagues, Dave Lose, this last week reminded me that, this in, uh, that faith is found, he says, not in the mighty acts of heaven, but in the ordinary and everyday acts of doing what needs to be done, responding to the needs of people around us and caring for the people who come our way. That's faith. So here's an exercise for you. And I had the people on Wednesday night do this, and the people at the last service did it too, so I promise you it will not hurt. I'd like you to take out a pencil or a pen or whatever you got to write with. Just grab something very quickly, okay? And on this bulletin, this little thing that you picked up when you came in here this morning, find a blank space somewhere, just a little space. It won't have to be big because I'm not asking you to write an essay. I want you to think of one thing and write it down. One thing that you did this last week for somebody else. To help somebody. Just one thing. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Praying counts too, by the way. Praying for somebody counts. It can be anything that you did for somebody, whether it was at your home, whether it was at school, whether it was at work, whether it was out in the community somewhere. Something you did for somebody else. It wasn't about you. Got it? Ten seconds. Nine. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Two. Three.
Time's up. Now take that piece of paper that you just wrote on and hold it up in the air above your head. Please do this. Everybody look around. Look around at all of these things, okay? Now quickly take them down. Imagine what this community, what this town, what this world would have been like if none of those things had gotten done this week. I know they all seem to you like very small, insignificant things. But I want you to know that this is how God works in the world. <laughs> Through us, in small, seemingly insignificant ways, to make the kingdom happen. To make things happen, to get things done. Hmm. All these little acts, ordinary things that are how God works. Just dragging your carcass out of bed sometimes in the morning and going to work and doing a good job, that's faith. Huh? Cooking supper for your family, it's an act of faith. Having lunch with somebody who looks like they need a friend, that's faith. Listening to somebody who needs to have someone hear them, that's faith. Writing a thank you note to someone who's done you a kindness, that's faith. Take Praying for a neighbor who needs some help, that's faith. The list could go on and on. And that's the point, see. None of these things is any big deal in and of itself. And yet it's just these kinds of acts of faith that occupy so much of our lives, and they are acts of faith. In confirmation class these last weeks, we've been talking about the story of Abraham and Sarah in the book of Genesis, this old couple who God invited to pick up and leave everything they knew and simply follow him and trust to a new place. It's one of those stories in the Bible that acts as kind of a, an example of tremendous faith. Do you have the kind of faith that they had? Well... I don't know, maybe you do and maybe you don't. But unless God is asking you right now to get up and leave this place and go somewhere else where he's leading you, then that's not the end of your faith anyway, right? Sometimes just daring to ask the hard questions, that's an act of faith. Sometimes just showing up is enough. That's an act of faith. And Paul writes to Timothy to commend him on the quote, sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. I think that's the kind of faith Jesus is talking about, because I'm pretty sure that Timothy's grandma, nor his mother, just like neither my grandparents nor my folks, were able to make trees get up and walk into the ocean by faith, and yet they passed on faith to me just the same way you are passing on faith to the young people of this congregation. <laughs> I saw a piece on the news the other night about how many of our ranchers here in this part of the state are really having a hard year with all the weird weather we've been having. It's been a wet, 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 wet summer. And not only weather, but with depressed markets. Huh? A lot of them are are left kind of scrambling, wondering. It's bleak for many. It's really hard for a lot of our producers to have faith in the sustainability of way of life passed down through generations, wondering if they can keep doing that. So, what are they doing? Well, I can tell you exactly what they're doing, and you could probably guess too. They're getting up every morning, and they're going out and fixing fence. And they're cutting and baling their alfalfa for winter feed. And they're caring for their critters and moving them to good pasture. And they're about the day's business of breeding and birthing and inoculating and feeding and sheltering and plowing and planting and harvesting and buying and selling. In short, most of them are simply doing what they need to do. Trusting that the God who called them into this way of life is still present in the middle of it and that is faith, you see. The good news for the disciples is that they have all the faith they need. They're following Jesus. They may not understand 
everything that's going on, but they're willing to trust Him enough to ask Him for more faith, even if that's a totally wrong-headed question, right? They're still following. They have all the faith they need. They just don't know it. That's all. Hmm. They're going to fail later on in the story as we read through it. They're going to fail to do what they need to do. They'll abandon him later when he's arrested. They aren't perfect people. And I think that's good news for people like me because sometimes I get the mistaken notion that if I were able to be there back in the day with Jesus, walking along with him, talking to him, asking what all these weird stories mean, that maybe then faith would be easier and I'd have enough of it. But even these guys who actually got to do that are still begging him for more faith because they don't feel up to it. And sometimes I think we fall into the trap of thinking that acts of faith need to be heroic that they need to be dramatic, but that ain't the case. Having faith means trusting that God uses whatever we can give, whatever we can do. These things are evidence that you have the faith that is needed. This week, coming up, will you continue to live out of your faith, please? Will you continue to trust Jesus when he says, that you have enough faith already, that you are enough already. Will you try to serve your neighbors so that, not so that they'll thank you, not so that they'll admire you for the strength of your faith or they will congratulate you somehow or because it'll make you feel good, but rather simply because Jesus told you to do it. That's living faith. Will you pray for somebody this week who's got it just a little tougher than you? That's faith. May God continue to work through you, continue to bless you. And yeah, may God continue to increase our faith. Amen.